Here we are, middle of the week, Colossians chapter 3. A lot of stuff in this chapter, so let's get started. Since then, and he's been talking about you've died to the principles of the world and you're alive to Christ. In Colossians, Paul uses that death and life a lot. He also uses the concept of Christ being the life and that force that holds all things together. We've seen that a couple of times already. It's going to hit us here in the next few verses. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Well, Let's go through this. Um, where you look matters. Where you've got your eyes matter. And I may have told this story before here. I've certainly told it in seminars and sermons through the years. But back when Cammy and I were, were newlyweds, my father had an old plane and we went in half with them, just a few thousand dollars, and then a few thousand more to get it to where it could fly, just a two-seater, fabric-winged, uh, metal body, uh, an air coop, ER coop. So we got it, got it flying. And that my dad was already a pilot, so it was my turn to take lessons. There comes that time where, as you are flying about, you know that you've really got the basics down, and that you're you're good at what you need to know, so that you can learn further. And though, and there's this little ceremony. You'll just be touch and go, touch and go, and touch and go. And then the, um, the instructor will climb out and say, take it on your own. And now you have soloed. You've gone on your own. Well, that was on this day. We all knew it. The instructor knew it. I knew it. That's where we were headed for. Just needed to get one more thing down. So he brings me around to land it. And we come down and we bounce a couple times and he says, full power, take it around. We did that maybe three times. Honestly, it felt like 20, but probably three times before he said, oh, I see what you're doing. He said, you're looking in the wrong place. And I said, what, what do you mean? He says, you're looking down. I said, well, down is where I'm going. I was aiming for down. And he said, no, you don't look at where you're going. You look at where you want to be. And he said, look at the far end of the air, uh, of the, the runway. Well, I thought that was ridiculous, frankly. Uh, and how in the world could that help? You already know the story, how that's going to end up. It helped. It, I greased every landing after that. Where you put your eyes matters. We, um, as men, we know that we're attracted by color, light, movement, and beauty. And where you put your eyes matters. And we should watch where we put our eyes. Women, I'm sure you've got some of the same issues, but I cannot speak for you. But I will say this. You've heard perhaps in business that if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Where you aim and what you're going for really has profound effect. If when you wake up in the morning, you're just trying to survive or if you have, uh, of course, any, any nefarious intentions, or if um, you want to get one deal over on this other fellow, or that's going to direct your steps. But if your eyes are on Christ, and at every situation you say, where is the Jesus in this? Where is where's the opportunity for the Spirit to move here? Or if he is moving, how can I join him in this? Well, it changes everything. In fact, he comes right back here to, to earthly things you died. To a Jew, the word death did not mean just what it means to us. To us, of course, death means cessation of life. Um, the body drops, it no longer functions. That is death. To a Jew, that's what death meant as well, but it meant just as much separation. For example, Adam and Eve. And the day that you eat of this, you will die. They ate of it. They were separated. They were shoved out of the garden, never to return. They were separated from their God until he created a path back to them because we cannot create a path to him. He has to create one to us. 
if we are dead to earthly things, it means that we separate. I find it fascinating and instructive that when Paul spoke to Timothy and in his letters to Timothy, he didn't say, when a youthful lust appears, you need to be strong, you need to think of these four things, you need to, um, you know, he didn't do any of that. He said, flee, get out of there. We are lied to uh, by ourselves when we think this won't affect me. Uh, teenagers are really good at this, but frankly, I'm not sure we ever really grow out of it. You know, I can go here and that won't affect me. And no matter what they're doing, that won't affect me. But where you put your eyes matters and where you put you matters. You can't be in control over every environment at all. And so I, I get it whenever somebody tries to go after a politician um, and says, well, look, here's a picture of them with this very vile person. Politicians get their pictures taken with people all the time and they don't know these people. They don't they have a background on these people. It's, I get that. You cannot control all your situations, but control what you can. Be dead to earthly things may just mean as going so far as if you've got a real problem with rage, maybe you shouldn't be listening to certain podcasts or certain uh, sports talks or political talk uh, host. If you've got a real problem with lust, there's a whole host of things not to watch. You would separate yourselves. They are dead to you, to use an American English uh, concept. You know, they're dead to me. It doesn't mean that they've um, all life has ceased. It means... I'm, I'm going to act as if they do not exist. I'm going to shove them aside. This is a job for every day. I do not know how you would, um, how you could function if you only did a checkup on this during Lent, let's say, or right before Christmas to be good. You really, almost every day you have to say, what am I alive to? Uh, and what am I dead to? Alive is also a bigger concept. Alive doesn't just mean that you can fog a mirror with your, your breath. It, it means that you are part of it. It is a part of you. It is a part of your living. So what is your life? He says, Christ is your life. Be dead to the world, to the earthly things. It's very important that whenever Paul talks about the earthly things that you must be dead to, and sometimes says the world, he's not using a place name uh, like earth. He's using a system word like eos or eon. In other words, it's all right. It's, it's fine to love flowers and bunnies and funny shaped clouds. It's, it's wonderful to enjoy nature. He's talking about don't get wrapped up in the way the world does business and the way the world defines things like success or riches. Don't get caught up or beauty. Don't get caught up in the world standards for this. You'd be dead to that, but you, it's just, it's still wonderful and fine to go walk down by the river. You know, it, that, that's a different thing. So we are living out our life in Christ, daily working on this separating from something and getting closer to the other thing so that when Christ appears, we have gotten ourselves ready for him. And Paul here almost certainly, is talking about when Christ appears, uh, appears at the end of time. I would suggest that Paul really thought that was just any day now. When I was raised, I was told any day now too. And people that are into the end times have said that for 2,000 years. But I think that it, perhaps there are a couple of other ways to look at this. One, yes, I do believe that Jesus will return at the end of time. I have no idea when that will be, and I don't believe that you do either, and that really annoys people, but that's all right. I do believe that I will have an end and that Christ will appear at that time in a personal way. That's, that's another. But what about this? You're going through your day trying to draw near to that which should make you alive and separating, you're, you're deading yourself, you're separating from those things that are, um, th that are worldly, that would drag you back. What are you doing? You're getting yourself ready for Christ to appear in the moment. Not as end of time, but as in what is Christ doing right now in this place with these people, with these things? What is Christ doing? And are you ready 
to join? Are you ready to be a part of that? So again, separation, he says, put to death, therefore. Uh, that sounds horrible. That sounds almost like when Jesus was talking about cutting off hands. And again, hyperbole, they would have understood it that way. It was never meant to be literal. <coughs> Excuse me. Put to death sounds very violent. But it, it's, it's rather like that flee youthful lust. It's a forceful, won't be easy. But put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Now, that's the way that the NIV reads, and I, I don't care for it. I like the NIV by and large, especially the 2011 edition. However, uh, it is not perfect. I'm not, you're not. We all understand that. Human beings work on things. And every time that they saw the word flesh, they would put it earthly nature, uh, really going off of the, it was a Catholic doctrine, but it, it's become a Protestant doctrine as well. And that is the fallen nature of all things, including nature and you. And so they use this earthly nature. I'm not real happy with that kind of, and I think it's, I think it's okay just to say we have some control and we have some nature, we have drives, and we have situations in which we find ourselves. Make the right choices. Make a good choice with what's going on with what you've got. So he said he gives he gives a list of things to stay away from. Sexual immorality, impurity, that's a big word. Um, that could be your motives in business. You know, lust. Usually we look upon that as um, a sexual drive uh, or a feeling, but uh, you know, a lust can be a jealousy, an active <coughs> jealousy where we are, you know, wanting what someone else has in a way that, um, you know, we're not wanting to, to work hard and have nice stuff. We just don't want that guy to have it. We want to have it. You know, one of those type things. It's desiring what doesn't belong to you. All right. And that's a real tricky one. Uh, I think all of us have trouble with that form of lust, if we're being honest. And then sexual, let me see, we did that. So uh, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. And he put that all under one. You end up worshiping what you look at and what you draw near to. You end up, that becomes your God. No matter who gets the, um, the lip service, the heart and the mind is directed in another way. Uh, and by the way, I read these things and I squirm because I too have to fight to keep my eyes where they belong, to keep remembering, all right, this is who I am. This is what we're supposed to be doing. No matter how that person treated me, I'm looking for the Christ in a situation. Oh, it's tough. It is. But that's our daily job. Uh, it, it's what we're supposed to do. He warns us. He says, because of these, these horrible things he just listed, uh, the wrath of God is coming. And you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. And so he makes another list. Paul was really into list in Colossians, and he's done that before. First Corinthians 12, you know, Romans 12, he, he, he will do a list. And so here comes a list. Get rid of all these things. Anger, rage, malice. Those all kind of sound cousins if they're not the same. So he just covers all of it. What would it be like going through life without anger? Without malice? Without rage? The world would be terrified of you. Uh, they'd think you're a freak. Because to the world, you're supposed to be outraged at what they are outraged at. He said, ending a sentence with a preposition. And if you're not, then you're a very bad person. And whenever you get caught in one of those, it's a very natural thing to be outraged back. And there's a, there's a whole cottage industry of people who spend their days being outraged on behalf of other people who aren't outraged. But you kind of ride to the rescue anyway, and you're outraged for them. He says, put it aside, put it to death, get rid of anger, outrage or rage, malice, slander. Oh, boy, there goes Twitter. Filthy language from your lips. Filthy language. When I was a boy, uh, that covered everything. We couldn't even say gee or golly. 
because uh, those are, and they are, they're replacements in the language for the names of Jesus and God. At least that's how they started. It's, it's rather like goodbye actually is a rushing of the way we used to say, God be with you. And God be with you, shove to goodbye. Um, it's one of those things that meant something then, doesn't mean something now, but we weren't allowed any of this. And filthy language would be to talk about anything sexual, obviously, but then any curse words, uh, all the way down to those, you know, golly gee whiz type things. I think filthy language covers some of this, but I think it also, it's anything that will tarnish your robes. doesn't have to be the F word constantly, which is one of the most boring things ever. And it just amazes me that people use it and the, the comedians will use it and the, and the whole crowd will go, <laughs> I'm going, really? You haven't heard that 50,000 times already? There, this is not new ground, one is you know, telling here. Anyway, it doesn't have to be the F word. It, it can be an attack on somebody else. It can be a blog post or a Facebook post against um, another church, another minister, or another um, your neighbor, because those things tarnish you. They don't clean you up. So filthy language could mean anything which doesn't have Christ in it. Well, there's more. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self. Now, here's another image he gives you. You know, dead and alive is one. Now it is put off, put on. And that um, those of us that are of a certain age, many years ago, there was a movie called The Karate Kid where um, you know, Mr. Miyake puts him through all kinds of different things and he doesn't realize he's being trained. That, you know, wax on, wax off type thing. Look it up, kids. Ask your grandparents. In the scripture, and especially in Paul, there are a lot of put off, put on put off, put on. So have a look at those. Just Google that sometimes or run it through your, your search engine. Put off the old self of the practices. You put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Look at it this way. Um, if I decided I wanted to change the oil in, in the, uh, my car today, I would not be wearing this. Well, this is not an expensive sweater or shirt, it is not one that I want to get oil and dirt off the, the garage floor ground into it. Paul's saying, all right, you've put on Christ. Let's not do things that'll mess up your new clothes, you, the new way you present yourself. Too many Christians behave very unchristian toward others and then wonder why the churches aren't full. Well, maybe Maybe we've used our new clothes in a wrong way. Maybe. Here he says, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. This would be the opposite of a racist because he's saying, no, you don't get a lie to people because they're not lesser than you. You, you see, you can't mistreat people until you believe that they are not your equal. And if they're not your equal, if they are lesser than you, you can shoot them for their shoes. You, you can uh, drop a bomb on them because they have a different flag. He's saying, no, with us, it doesn't matter who the other person is. And it doesn't matter who you are. If you've got on the clothes of Christ, you behave in a certain way toward everyone. I was reading actually today uh, a biography of Woodrow Wilson, who was, I believe without any question, the most racist of any president ever. He was the one who first demanded pictures, photographs that, uh, to be put on federal um, applications of employment so that he could weed out all black people. He encouraged the lynching of black people through his uh, Southern Senator friends. He segregated the army, uh, would not allow uh, black people to arise into any rank of leadership. He kicked them out. He said, there will never be one in Princeton. He was uh, once the president of Princeton University. I just on and on and on. It was just horrific. Now there's one black man that couldn't be segregated from 
the rest of the employees that were white because of the job he needed to do. So President Wilson ordered that a cage be built around him to keep him away from the white people. Now that's, that is beyond horrific. And then I'll open up because I know we're going to meet today with Colossians 3 and see that when somebody is bathed in Christ, they're alive in Christ, they've got the, their, their Christ clothes on, not something you take on, take off. This is who we are now. That's got to go. It's got to go. Uh, there are no more racist or racialism. We don't do that anymore. In fact, he goes, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Can I just throw a break here? I struggle, you struggle. I fail, you fail. We're all in this together and we all need Jesus. But the good news cannot be allowed then to slip timidly past us without us noticing it. Daniel was a captive in a very strange land. He'd had a brutal life, absolutely brutal. Been physically brutalized by being turned into a eunuch with the rest of the young men taken from Jerusalem. He had been brutalized by not being given his freedom, but having to serve the very one who ordered the, the, um, the castration and the imprisonment of his people. And whenever the angel of God appears to him, he goes, you are dearly beloved in heaven. You are highly regarded in heaven. Well, that was Daniel. What about you? Well, he just told you. You are God's chosen people holy and dearly loved. Now you can say, I don't really feel very holy. Yeah, I get, I really do. I get that. We try and I think we should keep trying, but the, we also have a savior who's pulling us forward. Remember Abraham believed and it was imputed to him as righteousness. So as long as we're walking that pathway, and he says, you are dearly loved. God so loved the world and the world wasn't cute and full of righteous people. When that was written, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You're loved. Remember that. Then he goes further. Bear with each other. <laughs> I like that he used the word bear with you. The ice maker is going to clunk here. Bear with each other. He doesn't just say, you know, enjoy each other because, you know, frankly, I'm sure that I'm not flavor of the month for everybody. And you might not be flavor of the month for me. And we may not be able to hop in a car and take a 10 hour trip without one of us jumping out on the interstate because our personalities are different. The way that we spend our time, what we want to talk about or not talk. All of these things are very unique to the individual. So Paul is saying, it's not always, always gonna be easy. Bear with each other. Bear with each other, forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Notice he doesn't say, as soon as they repent, forgive. Now, when you forgive, well, I'm gonna back up. If you are waiting for them to um, apologize and repent before you forgive them, they're in charge. They're in charge of your heart. They're in charge of your thoughts. It's much easier, really, just to forgive them and say, nah, my life no longer is dependent upon whether or not I receive a message from someone. I'm just going to forgive them and move on and live my life. It goes further. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Oh, there's a standard. That's an amazing standard. It's kind of like um, Romans 15 verse 7, where we are to accept one another as Christ has accepted you. I think I told this before, perhaps um, one of my deacons at a church I served years and years ago came in very upset and he had tried three or four times to set something up and every person who had said they were volunteering and going to help him just didn't. Or they'd show up once and not again. Now, this was not a bad person. This is a good person. This is a person that wouldn't have driven off volunteers. It, it, it just... These people all had something else to do or forgot about it or whatever. And he wanted to resign and just be done with it. He said, I'm just done with it. He looked at me and he goes, how long do you put up with this before you're done with it? 
and it wasn't very fair, but I was using the standard. I looked at him and I said, I think you should give everybody as many chances as you want God to give you. And I do believe that. It's, it's a high standard. None of us are always going to make it, but when we realize we've not made it, then we need to re-engage and work on it. We shouldn't become so comfortable. We just say, well, that's me. No, no, we need to forgive because we want to be forgiven. And Jesus absolutely linked the two. The scripture also links mercy, that if you want it, you've got to give it. Well, over all these virtues put on love, love has got to be the capstone. We've talked about that before because the Bible is just full of comments saying love trumps everything. And we then ignore those and go in search of laws and doctrines and theology that we can use to separate ourselves from each other. And God goes, no, no, love, which binds them all. Every, all of the goodness in the world is bound by love. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. A tribe in which I was raised, a religious tribe, anytime they saw the word one body, they would then use that to bash the other churches by saying we are to be one body, no denominations, we're not a you know, denomination, we're the church, and, and it would just go on and on. Completely out of context here. We're already in the one body. We're just supposed to act like it. We're already there. Just act like it and be thankful. We're called to peace. And then this next passage, let the word of God, uh, word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Many of you know where I have to go here. Uh, I was raised in a church that would not use instruments and in fact believed using instruments was willful sin against God. It, it was not out of ignorance because our teaching was that anybody, any honest individual could read the scripture and come up with exactly what we came up with, which was completely untrue. But we told ourselves that so often we believed it and I taught it, I absolutely taught it preached it, taught it in people's homes, believed it until I started paying attention to, well, wait a minute, what would happen if a Bible just showed up at the foot of some, you know, let's say Slovenian shepherd on a mountain who had never, never really known anything about God or scripture. It's in his language and he reads it. Would he come up with what we came up with and answer again and again had to be no they would use this as saying, all right, it says that you are to sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Doesn't say sing and play. Well, we, we had many things such as, well, when God tells you to do one thing, he doesn't have to tell you not to do the others. You know, when he told Noah to use gopher wood, he didn't have to tell him don't use oak. He told him gopher, so that's all you get to use. That's the way we read this as well. He said sing, so that's all you can do. It's not the way the Bible works. It's not the way language works. It's not the way. It's a, they want to be a Mandalorian here, but this is not the way. Let the word dwell in you richly. So what's with the singing all of a sudden? Well, it, it isn't. Dwell, peace, unity, and then wisdom, gratitude, thanks, and these things appear in songs. So let that just be a part of you. And besides, songs were the, the most effective way of remembering theology, of passing on your story. And so throughout the ancient world, the people would memorize long songs, like the Iliad and the Odyssey would have originally been long songs. They wouldn't have been songs the way we sing songs, you know, with three choruses, or a bridge, a key change, but it was a way of memorizing. And if you've ever watched uh, Islamic students study in their uh, Islamic centers, as they're looking at the open Quran, you'll see them rocking back and forth, but you also hear them mumbling, 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 these words. And it's almost sing-songy because that's, that helps you remember. 
So all of this is overflow with Jesus is what he's saying. He's not saying don't use a guitar. He's saying overflow with Christ. Understandably so. Here we go. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. This is kind of, um, Paul's slinging a lot of stuff out there right now. And it's almost shorthand. You could, you could even make it shorter and just say behave. Be nice to each other. Be kind. Wives submitting. Um, please go back and look at Ephesians 5 as we talked about that. We've covered that. We also talked about it when we talked about women in ministry on the Monday mornings. Um, you know, who told you about women in the ministry? So you can check all that again. In short, and in very much in brief, submit here does not mean that they're a little mouse, that they don't get their voice, that they have no power or authority in the home. No. It was a way of saying, this is, you, you got to work with this guy. Uh, I, I like it that in Titus, whenever he tells the women to love their husbands and love their children, it actually, if you went literal with the, with the Greek there, it would be be men lovers and kid lovers. Because let's frank it. Let's be frank about this. Um, it is it can be hard for women to love men because men are very simple in comparison to women, and they are bigger and they're dangerous as a rule. You know, they're they they can use their power for good or evil, but they're more aggressive. And again, we're these are very broad brushes here. But he's saying. Um, you know, women understand you're going to live with this guy. <laughs> and uh, a lot of complaints I hear from women about their husbands really boil down to he's not a woman. You know, he doesn't like going shopping for couches. He doesn't like it when I buy uh, new shoes. He doesn't understand why he doesn't. You know, and it's one of those things, guys, we do need to up our game and understand a lot more about this. We really do. But we'll never be women we are designed in a different way. And women, by the way, will never be men. And again, that's a controversial statement in our society now, but we're not talking about that. We're not talking about all that's in the news, right? We're just talking about our house. In our house, husbands are to love their wives. Don't be harsh. I mean, it'd be really harsh if I walked in and said, hi, um, I've decided that we need to live and I'm out of a hat here, all right? My not, what is that, North or South Dakota? North Dakota, I think. And we're going to move to North Dakota. And my wife goes, whoa, 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 we have a house here. We have a life here. Our grandchildren are near. And I go, hey, woman, pack. That would be sinful on my part. It'd be sinful for me to act like I'm listening and have no desire to shift a thing I plan to do. I need to walk into any decision thinking, how will this affect her? The woman I love? Will it still steal her peace? Will it cause her sleepless nights? Will it isolate her? Will it put her in harm? Will she feel her security be taken from her? Will she still be around her community? All of these things to not do so would be harsh. So nobody here is given the job of being the boss. It is a learn to work with each other. And ladies, sometimes you need to understand that men are very, very simple. You know, we, we have a very um, point action thought. We see the bear, we kill the bear. And so you have to be gentle with us as you try to reach us. And some things we still won't get. 
My wife's an interior designer, has all of the highest credentials. Uh, she is a delightful person and she tries to explain to me what she's doing. 43 years on, I still don't get it, but I admire and respect her. I'm not going to be harsh going, oh, just, pff, I don't want to hear that. No. And then children obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Do we not all know that if the father said, all right, go rob the liquor store, you don't do that. So he's not trying to cover everybody's situation. And this may not cover your situation. These are general admonitions. And there will always be exceptions to general admonitions, which is why, once again, we're very, very grateful that love is over all. All right. Father, the, this one, fathers, do not embitter your children um, or do not you know, drive them to wrath. Be gentle with them. Understand that they're kids, that you are loaned this child. It's really God's child. And you just get to be the influencer for a certain amount of time here. So you be very careful and don't drive them to wrath. You know, don't, don't say, I don't care if you want to be a school teacher, this family are plumbers or vice versa. You know, I'm picking on plumbers. You listen to them, you work with them, you love them. We good? Now we get a little bit rougher. And I hope that you've listened to the Monday morning messages on slavery in scripture. He goes, slaves, obey your earthly masters and everything and do it not only when their eye is on you, to, and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Paul had no power to disrupt the social order of his day. He could not change the laws. He could not give safe passage to slaves. In the Old Testament, God gave absolute rules because it was a theocracy and God could make the rules. In the New Testament, God makes the rules in our heart, but he understands that we are under governments which have different rules. So Paul's, and you know, by the way, most of their slavery was not anything like that slavery in the antebellum South in America. However, let's not sugarcoat it, slavery is slavery. And there were absolutely, um, I don't even know a number to pick here, millions of abuses. And so again, this is not a good situation, but he's saying, when you, do, when you are serving, serve, it as if you're, serve as if you're serving Christ. We know because we have so many letters and evidences from the first two centuries uh, after Christ, that a great many of the rich and powerful, even the political leaders came to Christ because they're slaves. You can call them servants if you want to, but sometimes they were slaves. Treated them and were such holy individuals that they taught the masters about Christ. And as in the book of Philemon, now the slave is your brother and treat each other that way. And so this is a, it's a slowing, slow roll. And one would wish that God would snap his fingers and end all wars and end all slavery. But he has called upon us to be faithful in a very difficult and a very dark place. And then a little reminder at that end, anyone who does wrong will be dealt with. There's no favoritism. In other words, when we get to heaven uh, or when we get to our judgment, that your master's not going to get an easier task of it because, you know, you're just a slave. So he could mistreat you. He could steal your wages. He could do whatever. No, God doesn't play favorites. So you do you. You do the best Christ you can be, even if it's in a bad situation. And know that God is watching and that God's judgment is going to be fair. And it won't be harsher on you because you are of the proletariat. You're just a peon, a peasant. <laughs> and this guy is aristocracy. No, God doesn't play that way. Well, let's stop and we'll go do chapter four next week. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your gifts. Without those of you sending in funds, we could not do this. You keep our lights on, 
You keep us fed. Thank you. God bless you. If you have questions, Patrick at rsafeharbor.com.